go along. Sean? Hi, guys. Thanks for joining us today. The, the first several slides are really just going to be copied from the UIL website. What you do need to be aware of is that there are updates to these category restrictions and to documentation requirements for you to, to be aware of. It is vital that you check that frequently throughout the year and that you get the Poetry and Prose Handbook. It's so much easier now because you can just download it and it's yours. So I would encourage each and every one of you to make sure that you get that handbook and check the, uh, the website frequently throughout the year. There's a lot of notices that come up. And there's also a great tab on the uh, oral interpretation page itself. On the right-hand side, they will list some specific books and authors that have either presented something that was troublesome or it's a, a particular author or type of literature that has been brought up before so that you know before you dig into that literature that there's already an issue with that or that it is acceptable. So I would encourage you guys to take a look at that out and explore the website. They've done a lot of great work to answer questions for all of you guys before a lot of people nowadays will just hop on social media and put a question on social media. And just so that you're aware that's not an appropriate way to get an answer. It's a, it's a great way to maybe get a consensus, consensus on how to handle an issue from different people or how they've handled something, but it's not a definitive answer. So just keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> as you see, we're looking at prose category A, which for, it tells you pretty specifically that you can do one to four selections of literature if you're performing a single selection, the selection shall be published printed material. I'm not gonna read the whole thing because I know that all of you guys can read and see the slide, but just to get you started to take a look at that. Um, some of the big things that people don't remember now that you have the opportunity to do more than one uh, selection is making sure that you're not repeating authors between categories. That's really vital that you check that before you get to a contest because you really you either have to take that chunk of literature out or replace it with something different or worst case scenario, your kid gets disqualified because it wasn't caught. Sean, so, can I interrupt for just absolutely. a second because you're talking about these restrictions here and you'll notice that we did not list the word, we use the word selection versus prose, even though what we do expect is for this to be a prose performance category, that's what the contest is, UIL pros. But we use the word selection because if you'll notice uh, later as Sean brings up another slide where the description paragraphs exist, it talks about the examples of the kind of prose you wanna use, fiction or nonfiction. And we suggest you use things like oral history, testimonies, interviews, and letters. And we do that because that's the whole essence of that particular category, which is called This Is Me. And we're asking students to go back and look at their own background, their history. And so it includes a lot of things that we wanted to prompt students to look at. So as opposed to just using the word prose, we chose the word selection. But that still means that your student should be reading a type of prose. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mrs. Riggins. So as you, you look at that, that's just the first chunk of the category restrictions. And you see under this next chunk that we have, it's about the goal of the category and exploring either that performer's ancestry, origin, heritage, or their dreams and aspirations. So it is pretty open. The, the thing that I will tell you, it gives you a great list here of what you can use and what you are limited to, okay? So all of that is in there. And I think it's vital that you look at, um, oftentimes with the categories co-authored and anonymous authors have been allowed or disallowed. And it's important to understand that they are permissible for this category. That's a biggie and that changes from cycles of categories. So the, the last part of that, and this is really your job as the coach, is making sure that the introduction 
is clear that the program is woven and that it includes all of the titles and the authors. There's a lot of people that feel like if they write it on the board or turn it in on their form that they don't have to do that in the introduction, but that is part of the requirements for the performance. So you do have to list all of the selections that you're doing and all of the authors and give them that, that due credit. I think it's a lot trickier with poetry than it is with prose, but it, just so that everybody's aware of that. Sean, can you explain to them what it means about transitions uh, with your titles? In other words, do I have to throw all of my titles into my introduction or do I have an option? No, you, you, you don't have an option. It, it says clearly for, for everybody in black and white, it says, um, shall include all titles and authors read during your during your performance. So if you don't list all of your titles and authors in the introduction, you have to list them during your transitions. So that's the, the point that Mrs. Riggins was making. And thank you for clarifying that with everybody, because I think that does get tricky. So I personally, I like to have everything done in the introduction, just in case a student happens to get nervous during the performance, or if you're your judge is so involved in the performance, they may not be listening for it in transitions. And this way, you know, it's covered in the introduction. And that's just a little thing. Not everybody does that. And everybody has a different school of thought on how you handle transitions. And that's not, that's not really what we're going to discuss in this, this workshop. But just as a heads up for you guys, you can do it as long as you're satisfying what they're telling you here on this slide that it is obviously and clearly stated either in your introduction or in the transitions. So we get to the, the meat here, the documentation requirements. This is where you have to pay particular attention to what you are making sure that you bring to the contest, okay? It is not required that you have to bring the actual published book. However, it is highly encouraged in case there is any type of question. So some of the stuff that we're gonna look at with the next couple of slides are how you handle some of these issues that are presented through the documentation requirements, okay? So as you're, you're looking at all of this, your first option under number four, where it says examples, okay? Actually, I'll back up just a little bit. Um, the, now we have these fantastic forms that are online for you to fill out. All that you have to do is click the fill button and you can type. So all of, all of you that may not have the best handwriting, this is your awesome option out that you can type it and any judge can clearly read what you have. And it makes it a whole lot easier. And just as a, one of the things that I, I do is I usually type the form, even though the kids have had a, uh, a BIM class or an intro to technology class, some of them are not the best typers and it may take them 10 to 15 minutes to type one form, whereas it will take some of us, you know, two minutes to type it in and then they proof it and sign it and we're on our way. Um, <clears throat> so uh, last year in the, in the age of COVID, and I know there's a lot of, if you're in the region with uh, Linda Alderson, which I believe is 3A region four, um, all of your documentation is submitted to her prior to the contest. And that's really what everybody wound up doing with COVID. And we wound up doing that at our region site, um, which was great. It made the process so much smoother. So this gives you what you're going to, what you have to do if you have to submit online because you can't ship them your actual published source through the mail. Um, you take a photocopy, um, if you don't have a photocopy or that actual book online, the Library of Congress gives you the information that you need that also has that really critical section on there about the genre of literature, which is something that you're trying to prove with this category, that it's fiction, nonfiction, etc., that it's not something that could be mistaken as dramatic literature or poetry. So it gives the Library of Congress, as long as you click on the full record, will give you everything that you need in order to satisfy that. Um, the next part is if it's part of a literary collection, it's vital that you do the cover 
and that you do their um, Library of Congress page that tells you some of that information. And then the table of contents that tells you the page number that the story starts and then the first page of the story. Okay, that's proving that that's actually in there and that's what you're doing. So I learned that a really long time ago from Rhonda Craig when she was at Mahaya High School. And I had some questions about how, what, what all you needed to do if you didn't have that actual book and what all that you needed. So, but what it does is it clarifies any questions. If someone were checking your documentation and what you were wanting to use came from a literary collection, that way you've got here's the book that it's from here's that page here's the library of congress here's the table of contents that tells me the page number it starts on and then you have that first page to verify that yes indeed that's the page number that it, that it starts on all of this may feel like overkill overkill to you guys but it's important especially if you're doing something from a literary collection that you take those steps in order to get that so as you look Anything that you print from an online source, it's vital that you have the URL at the bottom, and that's for anything. That's for extemporaneous speaking, that's for debate evidence, that's for poetry and prose. It has to have the URL at the bottom. And the, the reasoning for that is it's so easy for people to create documents now. This way it is clearly labeled at that bottom that you got it from a reputable source which is something that I think is important to talk about as well. And we can delve into that a little bit later, but making sure that that has the complete URL at the bottom of anything that you print offline, okay? So it tells you, I'm not gonna read through everything on there. It tells you a little bit about what is unacceptable. And in the age of social media, a lot of people are turning to social media to solve their problems and fix their issues and air their grievances, what have you. And for, for the life of me, I don't understand why everybody has to, has to post every single thing that they do on Facebook, or if they have a thought, it has to go on social media. But I'm from them. I was raised in, in Houston, but all my family is Midwestern and we're not big every single thing that you go through on social media. So, I don't know. I'm hopeful that that's a trend that goes away too with, with social. Tumblr, it's not acceptable. So. or prose. So I wanted to show that to you guys. So you see he's filled out the form here and he's got a fantastic coach in Barbara McCain at the end, who was legitimately his coach, which I think is wonderful. So you go here, it tells you this is the blue book, okay? And it tells you see the perfect love story here in their table of contents, but it doesn't give you a page that it's on, okay? So then you have to go through and here's the page that it's on. But it also, this is the vital piece of documentation that you have to have. And lots of people, this is why I was encouraging you to make sure that you get that first page of the story. One of the things that they do in the color books, it tells you right here, this short story, okay? So that's what you need to prove genre of literature. It would do the same thing if you were doing something that was poetry, okay? They give you that within the notes. That's where it's located within all of those books, okay? Those books are, are fantastic and there's great literature in them, but you've got to take those steps because it doesn't tell you in the table of contents what the page number is or genre of literature. So it's vital that you as the coach take that extra step and make sure that this is included in your documentation if you don't have the actual book with you in order to do that, okay? So at this point, okay, that moves on to B. And Gary, did you want to jump in with B or do you want me to keep going with the, the category descriptors? Sean, if you want to go ahead with the category descriptors, then I can okay. circle back around and kind of go through um, some examples of each one of those. 
Awesome. And that way we can see some different things, some do's Perfect. and don'ts with the examples. Perfect. Okay. So you can see pros B is a lot more open. Okay. As far as what you're allowed to do. And the true intent of the category is for the performer to pick literature that speaks to them, that they want to do, that either relays a message that they feel is important for them to get across, or it's a piece of literature that they really connected to and they either love that selection or they love that author. So it tells you um, in this particular category, again, I'm not gonna read everything to you guys, but it tells you under E, anonymous works shall not be used. So it's important for you to remember that you cannot use anonymous authors in category B, okay? And the, Sean, it is, one of yes. the other things that we added this year, as you're talking about these restrictions, we didn't put it in originally uh, the first year of the categories because in our opinion, again, just 10 people sitting around a table designing these, we felt like the category descriptor itself told you what kind of literature, what kind of prose should be used because it talks about fiction, nonfiction, news sources, speeches, essays, letters, and diaries. In no place there does it talk about selections from plays, screenplays, movies, and monologues. But we did see this year, because you know, because of the pandemic, we didn't get through the categories. There was no competition for the categories that first year they launched. So this year was really our first year experimental. Let's see what happens when people take the categories and run with them. And what we discovered was people were asking those kinds of questions. Can we use plays? Can we use monologues? And so in order to clarify, we added this statement in so that you would understand, no, this is pure prose, fiction, nonfiction, and it does not include theatrical pieces. Thank you. Okay, so that is for you guys right here under D, selections from plays, screenplays, movies, and monologues shall not be used, okay? And that is different from the, the category previous to this one, those were allowed. So it's important, again, that you go back to that, that handbook and the webpage and you make sure that you are as familiar with the categories as you possibly can be before you fall in love with the collection of literature for your kids. And then you have to turn around and tell them, oh, I'm so sorry, you can't do that because it's a monologue. Okay. So you want to make sure, because kids are so great to point out when we make a mistake these days. <laughs> so you want, you want to put yourself in the best position as possible. Okay. So again, it tells you that uh, co-authored works are permissible, but anonymous works are prohibited. So you need to need to be careful with that because I think this particular category where the this speaks to me in particular when people are looking for material that that may not have to be published, it's so much of it is anonymous these days. So it's important that you understand before they when they when they bring literature to you or you find literature for your kids that you know if it's anonymous you can't do it. Okay, again, the authors used in this category shall not be used in category A. So keep that in mind, especially if you're doing a collection. And sometimes that's hard to keep together if you have multiple kids or doing multiple collections and this kid loves this author over here, but so does this one. And then wait a second, are they both doing a chunk from that same author from different books in their category B or A? But you wanna, you wanna keep that in mind as you go through all of that. Now, Sean, I have a question for you and Gary now. Th sure. This committee, they say in category A, uh, uh, they talk about anonymous, but then they flip on you for pros, B, anonymous. So are they just trying to confuse coaches by saying you can do it in one category <laughs> and not in the other? What Was there logic behind why anonymous in A and not in B? Was that just to confuse us all? No, I mean, I didn't think so. And Gary, feel free to to jump in and add to or correct me if I phrase this wrong. But I, I feel like we thought there was material from category A that may be published anonymously due to that particular author's journey. 
and either what they were going through at that time period or who they were. In particular, you know, Catrice Skinner gave that great story about not knowing that she had a great grandmother that was African American and they didn't know it until that she revealed that she had been passing as white. So I think that naturally led into the discussion of some people may, may have published things in an anonymous nature. So that, that was my understanding through yeah, that. Yes, so it really, it does make logical sense for anonymous to be uh, mm -hmm. acceptable in that particular category, category because of the goal of the category. Correct. Versus category B, which doesn't really demand that you use anonymous. Correct. Okay. Just want to make sure you weren't just trying to confuse us out there. No. <laughs> no, that would be those extemp speakers this morning. So, <laughs> Gary, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, that was perfect. That's exactly what I was thinking because we had kind of that same thing. That category A was there for our kids to be able to express things like a letter that was written that maybe that author, we don't know who that author is, or you know, I, I, some letters from the Civil War or letters from wherever where two people were writing to one another and there's not necessarily an author there. We don't know who that is. So that's why it was there in category A, which opened that door to a whole lot more literature. So cat B, because category B is so open that we didn't feel it was necessary to put anonymous authors in there. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Correct. So again, it tells you to do the big thing with category B is no proof of publication is required. So the only thing that you have to submit is that form, which is fantastic. You just pull it up, type it and go. So, and again, it references you back to that UIL prose and poetry handbook. And I, I know I'm harping on this a little bit, but your athletic coaches wouldn't go to a contest without being fully familiar with the updated handbook. So that's part of your responsibility as the coach, because at the end of the day, you coming to the contest director and saying, well, I didn't know that I had to do that is not an acceptable answer if, you're if your student is not fulfilling the documentation requirements, okay? So we see we have category B for pros and I went through the same performer. We have Dr. David Stevens, UIL Conference One, District Six, and he's doing a couple of different pieces there. He's doing the Rotan Rotary Queen's Mistake by Cletus Arbuckle. And that you see over here, it tells you the type of literature and that's one which is published. And then Fisher County, Fisher County Foibles by Skip Thompson and that is transcribed, okay? So it tells you in this, in this category, you have that great box over here so that there's no confusion on what it is that you're doing. And it tells you on the form here what you can do as well, okay? And then you've got the coach's information there at the end. And just so we're clear, that is not Barbara McCain's real number. Although I really should have put her real number on there so people could have called her just to, to talk to her, love Barbara. If you don't know Barbara McCain, get to know Barbara McCain. She's, she's wonderful. Okay. Why would we want the cell phone on there, Sean? In case there's any type of issue with documentation, you can contact that coach directly and solve the problem while you have the opportunity to do it. Because if you don't have an opportunity to do it and it becomes a problem after the round, there's much less chance of getting it solved in, in favor of the student instead of afterwards, it's been this huge problem and, oh, I'm so sorry that I didn't do this. this because UIL is fantastic at reaching out and Gary and I can both attest to this for checking documentation for the state meet is it was submitted early and then it was proofed and reproofed and reproofed and reach coaches had the opportunity to fix problems because lo and behold, people did not submit things in the proper order or in the proper fashion. So UIL did a great job of letting you take care of that problem. And I will tell you this, and this is not, I'm not, I'm not bashing TFA in any way, shape or form, but what I'm, I am telling you is if you have an issue with documentation at TFA state, you're charged a nuisance fee. 
that comes out of your, your general fee. And UIL does not charge a nuisance fee. So that's, in fact, they don't charge you anything. So that's the, that's a great thing. So be kind to them because they're doing all of this for, for your benefit and they're not making money, they're spending money. So you wanna make sure that you do your part and submit everything properly. Hey, but that's a thought. I didn't realize we could we could make money off documentation. That's a great thought, Sean. <laughs> hey, Sean, before you before you move on, I want to point yeah. something out right quick. That sure. um, and it's great that you put this form up. So, in some of the examples you're going to see in just a minute, um, it's going to be the old forms. Sean has updated the forms that he submitted here, so we didn't have. Um, these nice little boxes on here. And I don't think we had the request for a cell phone number. So if you're, if you submit a documentation online this year, you'll see that because of the online documentation, um, the committee and Jana came up with the, with some suggestions and some ways to simplify things. And this is one of the new things that we did was, um, or that Jana did was to come up with uh, a nice little thing up here that says, was it published? Was it internet? Was it transcribed? And you can just put the category type in there. So you don't have to write all that out. So that was, um, that's a new addition to the form um, from what you saw last year on last year's forms. It is Gary, because we had type as a column, but people were either skipping it, not knowing how to answer it, whatever. So that's why I put the legend and that's why the pull down of one, two, three, you know, to try to make it easier, but also make sense. Hey, you need to fill this in and declare, was this published? Was it internet material? Was it transcribed? And the cell phone was there because we can always use that in an emergency situation before the tournament, but also during the tournament, if there's a question that makes it very fast without stopping the entire tournament to look for one coach, we can text them and say, we need to talk to you about this. We need to ask a question about it. Okay, so we move on to, did you wanna do prose examples before we move into poetry or do you wanna do those examples after we get through poetry, Gary? Um, yeah, I can, I can uh, share my screen and do the prose examples right awesome. quick. It's a little, it's going to be a little bit out of order from my PowerPoint, but that's not a big deal. I'll just um, skip to those right quick and uh, we'll look at some examples and go awesome. from there. Okay, so I should be, my screen should be up now. And we're gonna go to, this is an example. You guys seeing that okay? Sean, are you seeing my screen okay? Okay. So you see that now remember that these are the open forms, but um, this is the category form. So uh, what, what I'm going to talk about here is kind of the order of documentation that needs to be submitted. Um, what we ran into whenever we started looking at different kids' documentations when it was submitted online was that nothing was submitted in any kind of order. Um, there may have been the cover page first, and then the forms were submitted at the bottom. And as a coach, you're not thinking about well, I'm submitting this for somebody to look at for documentation. So how are they going to want this? So um, we're going to talk about the order that you submit things in. So obviously, um, category A is where we need to prove some documentation that, that Sean went over in uh, the category descriptors. So the first thing that we want to see is the documentation form, because that's going to give me all the information that I need in order to check documentation. So you see here we have uh, Brooke Smith with all the appropriate things filled out. Um, and then we go down and we see that the title of the book is Ride Cowboy Ride. Gary, I don't Max think we're Black. seeing that. I don't think that's open yet. Is B. that Smith not open? It's not open yet. Can you open that so they can actually see the documents? Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought that we were sharing that. 
we're seeing your list uh, in your documents, but we're not actually seeing the material. Okay. Let me try that again. So you're seeing that now? No. Can you huh. just open your slide, PowerPoint slide? Yeah, it's um, this part of the power. This part is just uh, on my computer. So I was just going to open up each one. I can see it on mine, but it's not opening it up. Let me see. Let me try something right quick. I apologize. Um, I tell you what, Sean, just go ahead with category uh, category A for poetry, and we'll double back to my descriptions, and I'll see if I can't get them pulled up. I don't know why they're not coming up. Just go, yeah. Just use your slideshow, Gary, when it comes when it works, and and that'll be fine because you've worked really hard on that. Okay, perfect. Okay, so can everybody see documentation requirements? Is that sharing? No, okay. we're just seeing your face. <laughs> Great. Let me get back to where. Okay, there. Category A, this is me. Yes. Okay. So it's very similar to category A of pros. And the um, there's a great statement in here that I think you all need to be aware of. I'm going to read it to you directly. When using copyrighted material, each member school is responsible for obtaining permission from the publisher for the participant to use the material. UIL assumes no responsibilities for copyright permission to perform material. So that's a new thing. And for all of you guys that are aware that have seen those great workshops about poetry and prose and one act play and copyright, you know, you know this already. But for those of you that haven't, I would highly encourage you guys, especially now that we're moving into a virtual hybrid sort of atmosphere where some people are recording things to submit, that you are making sure that you have permission from the publisher in order to use that material. And it's very similar to what the process that people go through in order to get permission to cut a play to perform for one act play. So if you're at all familiar with the one act play process and how you get a play approved, then you should under have an understanding of that process. But and again, this is not the this is not the meat of this presentation, so I won't dwell on it, but this is important for you guys to take take that information. Okay? That, and that the majority of the performance must be published. That's the two biggest things. Again, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you guys, but make sure, making sure that you're aware of that. Okay. So it tells you in the, the documentation requirement, this again, this is very similar to category A with poetry. So I'm not going to repeat everything, but it's, it's vital that, that you have that proof of genre of literature especially since so much of what we're, we're using comes from sources that include lots of types of literature. So you wanna make sure that you take advantage of that and get that. So we see we have Kathy Ann Schaffner and she's performing Homeroom and Elegies for Those We Have Lost Too Soon, Seven Acrostics, both by Kathy Appelt and then The Little Miss Pakasak Queen by Connie McKee down here is her unpublished work. And again, she's also coached by Barbara McCain. So you see it's listed here what, she's, what she has. So the unpublished work, 
okay? You don't have to include the documentation of what they're showing. You see here we've got poems from Homeroom, which is the cover, okay? And then you've got this Library of Congress page where it tells you down here, it's a little bit fuzzy, but it tells you very clearly, if you can see the cursor, it tells you poetry multiple times. Okay, so that that is without a shadow of a doubt, you know, genre of literature is poetry. So then we have the table of contents. Okay, we have homeroom on page three and elegies for those we lost too soon, seven acrostics on page 20. So we have the, the table of contents is here with those pages and then you have homeroom and you've got the page here. Again, I apologize if the page is a little bit fuzzy but that's listed for you guys. So you can see that that is indeed homeroom on that page. And then elegies for those we lost too soon. And you see the page number at the bottom. Okay. Well, and I think one of the things that as uh, you all looked at so many pieces of documentation for the state tournament, little things that coaches or students do could make things so much faster. Uh, as we talked about, do it in order, scan it in order if you're, e you know, if you're having to email it to your contest director. Um, but also, if it's not the book itself, obviously, and you're, you know, because you're doing this virtually, then highlight, highlight that title on the table of contents because it makes it so much faster for that contest director to see it instantly without having to read through all the titles of the table of contents and circle or highlight that page number there. Now those may sound like insignificant things to you, but you're dealing with three prose and three poetry. When you are a contest director, when you're a regional director, when you're checking state documentation, you're checking hundreds of pieces of documentation. So anything a school can do to make that faster and easier for that contest director to check, they will love you forever. So just little things like that, think about. Absolutely. And you had lots of people that, that did that and took care of that, which is fantastic. That's, that's exactly what we want. And, and going back to what she was talking about, about making it easier. I mean, that's correct. You're dealing with your students and that documentation. Your contest director is dealing with every student that's entered in that contest. And it's also, it's not your contest director's job to prove genre of literature for you with that. That's, that's part of your job as the coach is making sure that that's included in your documentation. So, and, and lots of people do a fantastic job with submitting documentation. If you're in the East Texas area, Amy Kasperzik does a fantastic job with submitting documentation. If you are on the, the Gulf Coast, the Coastal Bend area, Katrice Skinner does a fantastic job with submitting documentation. If you're in the, the Panhandle in that area, Ryan Lovell does a fantastic job of submitting documentation. So you look at all of that, there's great people out there in your area to reach out to if you have questions about documentation. I think that's important that you do that and maybe reach out to those people through an email or like a direct message in Facebook instead of posting it on Facebook for everybody to see and comment because that's where you may get some misinformation. Okay, so we move on to category B. It's important to note for category B that you're only allowed to use six poems. And yes, we get it. Poems are incredibly short now. And there is, there is a movement from a lot of people to, to expand that. But for right now, your category is clear that you have six poems. And a lot of, a lot of the rationale, there were a ton of people that were submitted um, questions and also people that submitted answers about this. But the big, I think the general consensus was if you get more than six poems, you're muddling author's intent. So that was one of the big things that we looked at when we, so six was not just a random number that somebody drew out of a hat. That was it, that came out of discussion and people bringing forth like maximum numbers and minimum numbers and agreeing upon six being a good solid number that it allowed you the opportunity to have a multitude of poems, but it doesn't let you have 
50 million poems within that collection. Okay, so you see all of the restrictions to the category. And again, um, I think it's big to remember about song lyrics. The song lyrics published as music only and not as poetry may be used, but their use shall be limited to transitions between the poems. So keep, keep that in mind as you're dealing with that category because more and more people are looking to song lyrics and it's important that you know how they are published. Sean, thanks for pointing that out because this was reworded from last year. Um, the wording last year said something like song lyrics published only as music, you know, may be used. And the feedback was that coaches didn't understand that. They didn't understand song lyrics published only as music. Correct. So we went back and we tried to, to reword it as carefully as we could saying that song lyrics published as music only and not as poetry may be used. I hope that phrase helps a lot of coaches who aren't familiar uh, or maybe are, are young coaches or those who haven't coached in Terp for a long time. We also took the word transitions, which we've used for a long time. And we had always said you can use, you know, for a lot of categories we have said song lyrics, published only as music can be used as transitions. And we found that some teachers didn't know what a transition was in a performance. So we have added the word between, and I hope that makes sense. Their use shall be limited to transitions between the poems. A transition is a bridge from one side to the other or from one poem to the other. That's what a transition in a, in a piece of literature or in a sentence would be anyway. And what we're saying is that's where you can use the song lyrics if they have never been published as poetry. Some song lyrics started that way, but then later got published in poetry anthologies. Okay, some of the Bob Dylan things, some of the Beatle pieces have turned into poetry, even though they originally started as song lyrics. So that's really what that means for you. And we did and we did change that wording to try to clarify a little bit more. Okay, so it's it's important again that you go back to the website and look at how the categories and descriptors and documentation requirements change year to year and that you get that handbook. So this, oh, went too far. So the, again, this is parallel to, to prose category B and this, this speaks to me, literature that speaks to me. So it's vital within your introduction that you're letting your audience and more importantly, your judges know how this literature speaks to you and why so that we get that part of the the justification of why you're selecting this literature for your category b okay sean also ask them if you'll go back for a second sure. to look at that second sentence in paragraph four some of the feedback we received after state was that coaches were not sure if transitions counted as poems. And so right. we tried to make that real clear. Unless published as poetry, song lyrics may be used only as transitions between poems. And look at this sentence. Although these shall not count as poems in the six allowed in this category, we also didn't want kids to just go crazy with song lyrics. So, you know, you never right. know what people are gonna do. So we added this sentence, lyrics used as transitions should not be excessive with the focus placed on the poetry itself. So that kind of went hand in hand with the sentence that you see right after that, that has already been in the category. If transitions are sung, the singing should be limited in scope. But there's your tweaking, there's your clarification, for people, if you're going to go out and be an ambassador now for the new categories, I say new, the revised categories, when people say, oh yeah, I looked at the titles and they're the very same as last year, be sure you speak up and say, oh no, 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 check again. There are some 
revisions. And this is one of those revisions to try to help people know. Coaches were saying, well, we don't know if it counts as one of the six. Transitions don't count as points, okay? Thank you. That, and that's, that's a big change. So that's why it's vital that you go back and read that year in and year out. Okay, so your, your documentation requirements, again, just like pros category B, is you the, uh, the form that's online that you type and fill out, and we'll show you an example. Okay, so we went with, um, again, this is Kathy Schaffner, and all of the poems are listed. You've got the poets, and also the type, is it published? Is it internet? Is it transcribed? Okay, so I, did, I tried to do a mix in there with you guys so that you could see that it is possible to do a variety, but that the, you know, the majority of your work. Yeah, I, I stuck with published because I kind of like having those hard books in my hand. <laughs> so I'm still stuck to the, the pages and the smell and all that stuff with that literature. Okay, so this is this is pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to go through it with you guys, but it gives you an example of this is all that you have to do for category B is this form right here and make sure that you uh, every single poem that you're doing is listed. Now you see it's got it's got room for your six poems. That doesn't mean that you could write another poem on there. Okay, that's that's what you're limited to is those six poems. That's it. Okay, so keep that in mind. There are there are people that will either create a blank if they feel they want to, or they're they're not really listening or reading what the category restrictions are. So you do want to keep that in mind. They they have the appropriate number of blanks for you on the form. Don't go over the number of blanks. Okay. And I think that's it for. For this, and we've got some some slides from Gary. If you're ready to to take it away, well, we're going to give it a shot and see what happens here, here. The PowerPoint I can share. The examples I'm not sure, so I'm going to try to share the examples again. And if not, we'll just skip to the PowerPoint and explain those. Um, While Gary is working, let me fill the time by sharing with you guys that there were members of the advisory committee, including these two guys, who did yeoman's work to look at all the state uh, documentation. And um, that's a lot when you're talking about 72 contestants in prose, 72 in poetry, and two categories apiece. You can imagine what that's like. And so um, what we're trying to show you here are really some of the very innocent mistakes that we want to catch so that you all can see why they could be improved and why they weren't quite what we had hoped when we first got them. Okay, so this says that I'm sharing my screen, but are you seeing anything on there or is it still blank? We see the list of your people. But your... It's, it's not actually sharing the other part? No. Okay. But I thought that was in your slides. Can you see my slideshow now? I can't. Can no. other people? Wow. That's crazy because it's on my computer and it says that it's sharing. It says you are sharing your screen. So I'm not sure. But open um, your, can you open your, is your slideshow open? Uh-huh. It's open and I'm seeing my slideshow as we go through. Um, just like it was on Sean's with my picture up in the right hand corner and my slideshow on the screen. Okay, somebody says it looks like only half of your screen. Do you have multiple screens? Nope, just one. Hmm. I think it's just sharing your window. How about now? There we go. Okay. Now we're seeing it. All right. 
Great. So are we seeing this now? The um, well, we were back at the documentation and doing it in order. We were looking good there for a minute. <laughs> okay, so now it should be the documentation form should be up. That's what we're seeing. Perfect. That's where we need to be. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is just look at some examples. I'm going to talk about some of the things that Sean already covered. Um, so we're just going to look at examples of how this was submitted and uh, some things that were right and some things that were wrong. Uh, the first thing in here is you see the documentation form. Um, we have Madeline Chandler, and this is poetry for category A. So this is the first form that somebody who's checking documentation is going to want to see, because this is going to tell me, and remember that these are the old forms, because I got these from documentation that was submitted this year. So this is not the new form, but this is the order that we want to talk about right now. So we see down here that um, we have one, two, three, four poems. Um, and they're all by J. Taryn Towers. Um, so there's the category A poetry form. Um, and we see that there's not an optional poem used there that's not published. So everything in this documentation is published. So then in my documentation, um, and I, I'm a huge proponent of having the actual book. So when I started thinking about how to submit documentation, I wanted to say, okay, if I was submitting my documentation in person, how would I want that to be? So obviously I would hand the documentation person the first form so they could see these are the poems that we're doing. And then um, I would show them the cover of the book, the outside of the book. So we see um, Sorry We're Close by J. Taryn Towers. So that's the um, cover of the book. The next page, and this is a little bit different, but this is one of the things that Sean talked about in all four categories is we want to make sure that we know what we're looking at. How do I know that this is poetry or how do I know that this is prose or where is that going to be listed? Well, if I'm actually looking at the book, it's easy to see, but submitting it online is not as easy to see. So what I did here was I um, put the back of the book to make sure that we see that it says poetry right there on the descriptor from the back of the book. So we know that this book is a book of poetry. It's one of the things that we know. So um, my next page, and you can see there's the back of the books, the ISBN number. So my next page is just the title page of the book. Um, there it shows the, the press, but I went ahead and, went and, and put in the page that shows where the copyright is. So I know that this is Sorry We're Close, copyright 1999 by J. Taryn Towers. And if I look down here, um, I can see the ISBN number and so forth. What I don't see on this page is a description that says this is poetry, which is why I put the back of the book for a description that says this book is poetry. And I can see that there um, because it wasn't in this particular description. It didn't say um, poetry in there. Actually, it does say poems up here at the top, but just to make sure so it's easy for the documentation um, checker to see, it's, it's there for them to see that this is obviously poetry. Um, and then I put in the table of contents is the next, um, the next page. So you see that um, I'm not smart enough to highlight things on the screen. <laughs> Plus, I didn't want it to look like that I was manipulating the document. So I just circled um, that particular poem, which we see is on page 20. The next poem is on page 22, um, page 52, and then down here on page 102 um, are the poems. So then I included the poems in order, and we don't always see page numbers on poetry books because sometimes you know, the page numbers are every other page, so we don't always have those. So this one fortunately has the page number and it has how to get a good night's sleep. So I can look back on category, on my category form and see that how to get a good night's sleep is the first poem that's listed. So I've shown that that is documented. It's in the table of contents, how to get a good night's sleep. 
And then I submitted the first part of the poem, first page of the poem, how to get a good night's sleep. And we go through that document and that we see each part of the poem uh, or each poem is listed here, our copy of it's listed, making mistakes, phantom limb, um, junk drawer. And those are the poems that are listed on category A. The next thing that I listed is my category B form. This speaks to me. So as a documentation person, what I'm doing in category B is I'm looking at a couple of things. First, I'm looking to see is the same poet used in category A as in category B. So the way that this is listed, and I'm gonna do this really fast, so I hope I don't um, make anybody seasick here. But if I scroll back up as a documentation person, I can look and see that's J. Taron Towers as the poet in all four of those poems. And I go back down to Cat B, the form, and I see that it's um, Rudy Franseco. So I know that they didn't use the same author in category B as they did in category A. Um, and then they also use some other poems here, uh, Warren Shire, Rudy Franseco, uh, all the way down in those particular titles. So they used five poems in that category. Now, all I submitted in Cat B was just that form. And I will say, that this was probably, especially in my regional documentation that I checked, this was probably the biggest mistake that I saw was that a lot of coaches went ahead and made um, copies of the front page of the book, the table of contents, and all of that for category B for each point, which just adds a whole lot of work for a coach um, to have to do when it's not necessary. Because the only thing that we have to show for category B is that documentation form. So there's no reason to copy all the rest of that stuff to submit. Um, so that would be uh, category A poetry. So I am going to close this down, hopefully, and open up another example of poetry. Um, We are going to look at Okay, so this is um, a poem from one of the books that Sean used at the beginning, um, one of the color books. So we see in category A, here's the documentation form that they are using um, Attack of the B-Grade Boyfriends by Yolanda Williams, which is in a color book, one of the color books. So we see that this is in the yellow book. This is the front cover of the yellow book. And then we see the table of contents. And here it says, it's highlighted, Attack of the B-Grade Boyfriends, but you can see that it's handwritten out here as poetry. Well, obviously that was written by a coach or by the student saying, hey, I wanna do this poem and it's poetry. Now, I can't accept that as a documentation as a documentation checker. I'm not able to accept that because I don't, I mean, I obviously know that that's poetry in my head, but there's no proof there that that's poetry, which is one of the pitfalls that we run into. So let me scroll on down and see if maybe they documented that down below. So as I scroll below, the next thing that I see is the category B page that shows that we're doing Kisses by Elise Sharon. Well, my category B documentation is good because they're not using the same point, but my category A documentation is not good. And there's two reasons. Number one, how do I know if this book is published? And number two, how do I know that Attack of the B-Grade Boyfriends is an actual poem and not a piece of prose or some, something else? Because in these color books, there are all kinds of genres of literature. There's poetry, there's prose, there's performance um, literature that's in there that can't be used in either category. Um, so we have to go above and beyond. So I'm going to close this particular screen and I'm going to open up 
her resubmission, which was just added to. So here we see um, that she did the inside um, cover of the book, which does show that it does have a copyright date. So we know that it's copyrighted and that it's published. And we also put in here, like Sean showed us in the first example, um, that we see that in the notes that this is poetry interpretation. So we've now proven that this was um, a piece of poetry published in this particular book. <clears throat> and really and truly, this documentation there's another page in the color books, if I'm not mistaken, that actually says the publishing information, which should also be added to this documentation that was added later. Um, but that just goes to show you that it's, it's not as easy to document things sometimes as, as what we think. Um, there's a lot of steps that need to be done to get that documentation. Um, so let me show you uh, another example. <clears throat> we'll look at an example of prose. So um, this is Shelby. And she is doing uh, two different pieces of prose from two different books. So We're Okay and How to Make Friends in the Dark. And we also see that here's the anonymous author. Um, because she's using two published works, she can use one unpublished work in this particular category. And we see that parental issues by an anonymous author is being used in this particular category. And that's okay for category A of prose. So we're okay with that. So as we scroll down in the order that it needed to be submitted, we see the cover of the book. We're okay. Um, now, this to me is, is kind of a mistake and I understand, and I'm gonna say that this is my own student. So I did this myself. And when I submitted this documentation, I thought that I'd fix this, but I didn't, um, which was when I copied this and scanned it and sent it to myself, it turned these sideways, which sometimes makes it hard for the documentation checker to look at your documentation because they either have to flip it around or look at your screen sideways and do this while they're checking documentation, which is okay. I mean, it's not, it's not a deal breaker. It just makes it a little more difficult. So if you can scan it to where everything is right, so you can look at it and scroll down, it makes life a lot simpler. But we see that here's the title of the book, We're Okay. Here's the, um, the inside of the book, We're Okay, a novel by... So we know that that is prose because it's a novel. It says it right there. And then we have to have proof of publication. So there's the proof of publication page sideways, but it does say proof of publication. So we know that that, that's, that book is published. And, um, and I didn't include anything inside the book, like a table of contents or the first page of the story or anything like that. And the reason for that is in prose and documentation, if we're using a book in its entirety or cutting a cutting from a book and it's not an anthology, you don't have a table of contents necessarily. And there's no reason to, to copy that table of contents and or the first page of the story because it's all one story by one author. So in that, we only see the copyright page and, and then we go on to the next book. So on the, cat, the category sheet, we see that How to Make Friends in the Dark is the next book that's listed by Kathleen Glasgow. So here's uh, Kathleen Glasgow, How to Make Friends with the Dark a novel. It's right there on the first page. So that makes it very convenient for the documentation checker. And then we have that that's sideways. So I've tilt my head to read that. Um, and then the publication page showing that this book is published and the publication information that you need. Okay. As with the first one, it's only one book that the stories are taking from. And then I have category B, 
this speaks to me and all I'm doing is looking to make sure that, <clears throat> that the same authors aren't being used um, in category A. And this is an old form. So we see that, that this is fiction and that this next selection was a memoir. In the new forms, you got the convenient little drop down menu where all you have to do is check those so it's already there. Um, and then of course it's signed at the bottom. Well, I'm glad you said signed at the bottom. How many, Sean and Gary, how many uh, forms do you think we got that were not signed sometimes at all by either the contestant or the coach or by one or the other? How many of those did we get? And we really can't accept those. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, say 30 to 40%. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, you know, um, one of the things we want to cover here that, that we talked about in the PowerPoint, um, you know, as a documentation checker, and, and Sean can speak to this as well, um, you know, we had to submit our own documentation for our kids too. Um, and when I submit my documentation, I have that form open um, and the category descriptor open for me to look at to make sure because when I put it into this form, it's going to tell me, oh, my gosh, I've made a mistake. I can't use this for category A because I can't find proof of publication or I can't use this for category B. So having your descriptor open and reading that descriptor and then putting it into the documentation form helps you as a coach. And this is your job, in my opinion, as a coach to make sure that you're double checking your students and that they have done the right thing. So they don't get to a contest and walk in and their documentation not be correct. Cause that's our job as a coach to make sure that our kids have the correct documentation. So I, I just think it's, it's a great way to double check yourself. Cause there's so many times where you go, oh, wait a minute, I can't use that. That's an anonymous author. And I'm, I'm trying to do category B and I can't use an anonymous author in category B because it says it right there in, in the descriptor. So those descriptions are so very important. Um, if we have time, I have one more, one more that I'd like to show you. And Jana, you can speak to this because you actually had to help in this. Um, and I don't, I don't think this coach is with us today, but. Um, this was a student that submitted regional documentation and they are doing um, in category A, My Mind on OCD by Nathan Clarkson and OCD by Neil Hilburn. So when I scroll into, um, and also they have an unpublished work called Seven by Noon Otto Redder. Um, and remember, I'm not worried about the documentation for that unpublished work. But I am worried about the documentation for um, my mind on OCD and OCD. So as I scroll down, it's sideways, so I have to turn my head. So I see in the table, table of contents, it says, read this first, even if you never read introductions. OK, all right. I see that. I'm not sure yet what it has to do with anything. Because the name of the poem is My Mind on OCD by Nathan Clarkson. So I see that and I'm going to scroll on down and I see the poem Nathan. And it says point number one. But the title I see sideways here is read this first, even if you never read introductions. Well, I'm confused at this point in time as a documentation checker. So I'm going to scroll back up to my category. And I see that this is says my mind on OCD. And this says Nathan. Those don't jive. That's that doesn't that doesn't mean anything. I'm, I'm very confused as a documentation checker because I don't have the book in front of me. So as I scroll on down, I see a screenshot of a YouTube video that says my mind on OCD. So okay, there's the poem, but that's a screenshot of a YouTube video. How is that a poem? I'm not sure if that's a poem or not, because I don't know as a documentation checker. I can see that the coach wrote, wrote on here, poem one, spoken word, published as Nathan. 
well, if it's published as Nathan, why is it written on the documentation form, my mind on OCD? It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense with the documentation form. So I scroll on down and I see here that there is an introduction um, that's kind of hard to read here, but it says spoken word poetry, which is spoken word, but not published. And then there's a thing that says point one clarification see YouTube pick for the page. Well, we can't use electronic devices to show for documentation. So just because it's, it's on here as um, a picture, it still would be the same thing as you showing me an electronic device, a YouTube video of the point. So in all of this big long pages here, I still have not shown that this is documented. Um, and then here's the next part of the book, category A, and I can see poem number two, copyright information. Here's OCD, and there's the poem number two, OCD. So that poem's good because that's the first one in the in the book. And then I have some other things here that are that are listed, and it still hasn't really clarified anything. And I'm going to go through and say that what had to happen with this, and I don't know if Jana remembers this or not, but what ended up having to happen with this was the coach and Jana had to get together. And what it amounted to was that in the introduction, my mind on OCD was actually a poem in the book um, that was written as kind of an intro to the actual book. So it was a poem, it was published. Um, the coach had to submit some other documentation with that poem in the book to Jana for Jana to look at and approve. And this, this was a, an ongoing, um, probably <clears throat> two and a half, three hour discussion um, about was this published or was it not published? And so, and the reason I bring this up is not to not to say anything bad about what what this student did, because if I remember correctly, I think the student might have advanced on to state um, with this from from region. I I really can't remember, but that that is that's some of the pitfalls that we fall into when we start trying to prove documentation that something's published. So this piece of poetry, my mind on OCD ended up being a poem that was published in a book in an introduction, but had to have way more clarification. So long story short here, had this person shown up to contest with this documentation, day of contest and said, here's my documentation 30 minutes prior to the round, this documentation would have never have been proven um, because it, there wasn't enough proof to show that my mind on OCD was an actual poem. There had to be a lot more legwork done and a lot of things resubmitted um, to the regional contest director as well as to um, Jana in order to prove that this particular poem was actually a poem in a book. So I say all that in regards to please be very careful with your documentation and read those category descriptors and understand that if there's anything in your mind that raises a red flag that says, wait a minute, I'm not really showing that this is proof of publication, that you need to reach out to ultimately to Jana to clarify and say, hey, I'm having problems clarifying this and do that well in advance of the contest. Um, like, you know, in December, whenever you're looking at kids' poems, and make sure that they have all of that proper documentation and that it's listed correctly. I hope what one of the things that you see is, do you see how frustrating it was to look at this when it was scanned in incorrectly? Um, again, if you, more and more we're moving to digital uh, documentation submission, even if it's an in-person tournament this next year, <clears throat> There are lots of districts now, particularly regions, 
that are requesting that you turn it in early. There's a lot of advantage to that. I get complaints a lot from coaches going, why do they have to have my documentation right now? Well, they're actually protecting your student because if you send it in early, then there is that chance that if it's not right, they could allow you to fix it. Whereas Gary's saying, if you show up and your, your student's standing in line 30 minutes before the contest and show something that's inaccurate or not sufficient, then first of all, that student gets all upset and gets flustered that will impact their performance, even if they do get eventually approved, but it may not be approved. And how many times have you been to a contest, particularly at district where students show up, they don't have accurate documentation and they're told, no, I'm sorry, you cannot read. Well, that's devastating for lots of people. It's certainly very difficult for the contest director who's having to review that. So what I, I guess what I'm saying is some of the things are very simple. Sign your forms, have your students sign the forms. Second of all, scan them in order so that everything flows very quickly for that contest director. And thirdly, make sure that you don't scan it upside down. That's a real struggle. Um, and it would make it so much easier when you're looking at digital documentation that it just flow very, very quickly and all in order. like you know, put the cover of the book first and then the Library of Congress page, you know, the title page, the table of contents, and then your first page. Now that may sound OCD and that may be very difficult for some of you who are not, you know, you're, you're the creative genius and you, you don't tend to do things in a real structured manner, but we just want you to see why it would have made such a difference. We spent weeks with state level documentation. And that's really scary, guys, when you think about it's been through district, it's been through region, and it's at state, and it's causing this much issue. When the committee is fully convinced that we have all worked very hard to try to make documentation as simple and straightforward as possible, I think it just means taking the time doing it in advance, as Gary says, look at both copies, look at your descriptor at the same time you look at the form so that you're thinking very focused on what are they asking proof for. Don't just assume because you have the book in your hand that it will make sense to the contest director who's not seeing that book when the documentation is digital. Okay, you may say, but I've got the source. I know what this is, but the contest director can't see that book. The contest director can only verify what you have sent in the order that you have sent. One of the things that we've really had to work with folks on is listing your titles correctly. And we even put notes on the documentation form that say for poetry, list the poem itself not the title of the book. Most poems are not in a single book all of their own, but they're in an anthology. We don't need the title of the book. We need the title of the poem because of contest rules that say if you perform something at state, you can't perform it again at state. So we can't just have an overall title. We have to have a specific title of the poem itself that your student is presenting. Gary, back to you. Um, yeah, that's that's just that's one of those things that we need to make sure that that it's it is frustrating as a um, contest director to look at the look at your um, documentation that was sent in and not be able to figure it out. And and here's here's what I want to I want to say about region documentation as well as state documentation. Never be offended by someone who calls you as a coach and says, hey, I'm not understanding this. Can you help clarify this? Because that's we we as documentation checkers, this is not a gotcha game, especially to me, like 100 percent. There is nothing worse as a documentation checker than to have to call somebody and say, hey, um, your documentation is not right. 
are being at the contest site and saying, I'm sorry, but your student can't read. That's, that's the absolute worst thing as a documentation checker that you can do. So having the phone number listed on there now is great because that helps me when I'm checking documentation to call a coach and say, hey, I'm not understanding. Just help me out with this. And it may be as simple as talking someone through that, that document and saying, yeah, here, look, it's right here. I, um, I put it on here and I'm showing you how it is. Um, or it, just resubmitting something. Um, you know, like, like Jana talked about, you know, listing the poems the way that they are in the order that, that we're reading them. And you can see in this particular um, list of poetry on, for an example, this poem, there's an orange tree out there. Um, this is the actual author, but in the book, it's translated by this person. So it's important to list this because in the book, um, there may be, it may be different the way that it's written. So it's important to put and give credit to both of these people um, because yes, this is the author of the poem, but this person actually translated the poem um, into English in this case um, in the book. So that's, that's written down here. And I'll say again, this is sideways. This is my fault as a technology person for putting things on here sideways. But the, the first poem that's on here is the Pledge of Allegiance, which whenever this student came to me and said, hey, I want to do the Pledge of Allegiance to open up my, um, my poem, I was like, I don't know if that's a poem or not. The first thing we're going to have to do is prove that the Pledge of Allegiance is a poem. You have no idea how hard that was. It was not easy. I could Google it and that was easy, but to actually get it in writing to show that it was published took a little time. Luckily, my wife is an elementary librarian and had this great book that has illustrations in it and talked about it being a poem. If I scroll down here in the book, um, somewhere in here, I know it's sideways, it talks about it. Um, uh, Mr. Bellamy published his poem in 18... 92 in the children's magazine, The Youth's Companion. Well, yep, it's published, but it was published in a children's magazine. Oh my gosh, I can't, am I going to be able to find proof of that? Obviously, I'm not going to be able to find this as proof that the poem was published. But if I do some uh, due diligence and some research, you know, I can see that, oh wait, this is a published book and the poem is written out in this book. So therefore, it's a published poem. And I'm showing that it's proof that it's a poem by um, showing that page of the poem where it talks about it being a poem. Um, and to be honest with you, I had a little bitty tiny book with me too, that just in case I wasn't able to prove it this way, I had another book to prove that it was actually a published poem if it was ever questioned. So I second guessed my own documentation to make sure it was there. So we see again that there's the first poem, the Pledge of Allegiance. And then the next poem is in this book, Red Hot Salsa, um, bilingual poems. So we know it's a book of poetry. Guess what? It's an anthology because it has different people in it. So um, I put my publication page and then I put the table of contents with the page number and then the poem itself. So um, each one of these, and they all came from different books, because here's another book, um, Cool Sasa. Uh, there's the first page inside. There's the proof of publication page. Um, and then here's the table of contents for that with the poem circled each one. And then there's um, the actual first page of the poem, because it's an anthology. So there was a lot of documentation to this particular piece because it had so many different pieces coming out of so many different books. And then again, there's Cat B, um, which was several different authors. So I had to double check and make sure that none of these authors were being used in category A. So just another example. Jana, Sean, you have anything to add?
Questions? Well, just kind of looking through the chat real quickly. I know we have another speech session <coughs> starting for debate in, at four o'clock. So we're going to have to end this fairly soon. Sean, if you'll think about some summary uh, comments, but just looking through the chat, uh, there was a question and I think I answered it, but I didn't answer it for the whole group. And that was, can you show proof of documentation on your cell phone? No, you cannot. The UIL handbook very clearly lets you know that. And Sean talked about that handbook. Please, please, please go to the UIL oral interpretation webpage and click on that handbook and make all the copies you want free. We don't sell it anymore. We just want you to read it. There is an entire chapter that addresses the categories and documentation there are frequently asked questions. So you will want to know that. Not only go quickly to the website and garnish what you can do there, but take the time to read the book. First of all, the book is a wonderful oral interpretation textbook that you can teach your students what oral interpretation and the art of oral reading is all about and how to analyze literature, how to prepare their performance, how to prepare their manuscript, all those things that go into pre-tournament, you know, preparing for the performance is in that book. But there is a chapter that is dedicated to that. Now, since we reworded some of the categories this year, I'm still working on those revisions. So the new one's not posted just yet, but that's on my to do, got to get it done now list. So it will be up very, very soon. You can see what last year's looked like and get a lot of ideas from that already as well. So anyway, don't forget that handbook because it will answer so many questions and prevent your student from getting to the contest and not having what they need if you just use that handbook as your guide. As, as Sean said earlier, I love that statement about, you know, a football, a basketball coach would never put a team on the court or on the field without knowing what the rules are. And I think sometimes academic coaches sell themselves short because they don't do the research and they don't pay attention to those rules of documentation. Documentation is only there to equalize a playing field. Because if we give you the boundaries of a category and then somebody else's student just reads whatever they want that doesn't even apply to the category, is that fair and equitable? It is not. And that's why documentation exists so that your student proves that they have truly met those category boundaries to make it fair and equitable. We thank you today. Uh, Gary or Sean, do you have any parting words for anyone? Do your documentation. Get it done. Get it done early. The, the quicker you get it done, don't fall in love with a piece of literature until you have the documentation. And more importantly, don't let your kids fall in love with performing a piece of literature unless you have that documentation. Because all that that's gonna do is undermine that kid's trust in you as, the, as their coach. If you can't make sure that they get to do that, okay? Yeah, I, I would have to ditto that. Um, that absolutely make sure you have the documentation. I encourage everybody to find the book um, and have the book there because it just makes life much simpler to document something if you have that book in front of you and you can make copies of that. So yes, please do your documentation, do it early and encourage your districts and your regions if they're not doing so to submit documentation early and not wait till day of contest so you can eliminate any of those crisis moments right before contest. And I do think that more and more, one of the things we've learned that's going to come out of the virtual world is that more and more districts and regions and state will move to digital submission and doing it early. So I think you ought to probably start thinking in that direction, getting used to it and understanding some of the simple pitfalls, just scanning upside down. It, it, 
did you see how hard it was? And I'm glad Gary left it that way. So you could see the struggle and the wasted time of that official. So be kind to them when you think about that. We've talked about why documentation is important. Uh, we talked about certainly virtual that forced us into digital. Um, and so you can see now that there are some good things about digital submission. We can protect those kids and get that documentation right before the contest. Um, we cannot look at bullet number three. What's the big deal? We all know it's published. You know, it was at state meet one time that they had to prove um, a, a birth date of Mark Twain. And that student did not have that. And the comment by the coach who was very flustered at that point was to say, well, we all know Mark Twain was born, yada, yada, yada. No, we can't accept that because we've asked all the students to provide proof of whatever it is the category requires. It wouldn't be fair to just say, oh yeah, I know the answer to that question. So I'll just check you out. And I think sometimes that's what happens at lower levels like district because you know those other schools in your district, you don't want to disqualify a kid, you want them to get to read. And so it's just easier to say, yeah, I know, but clean this up before region. Guess what? They get that gold medal at district and they forget all about cleaning it up before region. So you're doing the student a disservice as well as the rest of the kids in the realm. No, you can't just show it on the phone. Uh, can't I just bring it with me to the contest? We don't know what this year is going to look like. I do think there will be hybrids. Um, I do think there will still be virtual tournaments, although not all, but I do think they will happen because what we've been able to see is that students have been able to compete with kids all across the state that they've never been able to do because they didn't have the travel budget money to do that. So I think there are a lot of tournaments that will still be offered virtually. And I also think, and one of my, my session on Wednesday talks about what are we gonna carry for? What does the future look like because of the past virtual and because of this pandemic? What are the good things that we've learned that we can carry forward? And this may just be one of them, digital documentation. So please, 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 Think about it. And even if it's not digital, what Sean and Gary have taught you today is get it in order, be organized, make sure you've thought through, have I really proved what the documentation requires me to prove? Can we, uh, can we give some kudos to these two guys and the hard work they did uh, also for what they did for state competitors because they spent countless hours and days trying to help students get their documentation done and done well. But we do thank you for attending this session and make sure that if you need CPE credit that you follow through with that. And if you have questions, I'm not sure these guys, I think, put it up on their uh, slides, what they're, how they can be contacted, but I'm sure that they would be more than welcome to be sure that they answer any questions that we didn't answer for you today. We're gonna let you go because we have another session coming up, but thank you so much.